We apologize for the lengthy break in the production time of this podcast. Haps and Stephanie's vacation time to Haps Stomping Grounds in northern San Diego County, along with some PC problems, combined to a six-week gap. Well, what do you want for nothing but a smile? You know what they say, to err is human, but to really foul things up takes a computer. This is Rain Hamcast podcast number 87, posted April 22nd, 2023. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. From time to time, we borrow from other podcasters to share other interviewing styles with you here on the Rain Hamcast podcast. We're borrowing this time from QSO Today, a weekly one-hour interview podcast conducted by Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, born and raised in Southern California, but now residing in Efrat, Israel. Back in 2017, Eric interviewed CQ Magazine editor Rich Mosesen, W2VU. Here's the first of two excerpts from that conversation. My QSO today is with Rich Mosesen, W2VU, the current editor of CQ Magazine. From his vantage point as the editor of one of the oldest and prestigious amateur radio magazines, he has the opportunity to see the big picture of our ham radio hobby every month from articles published, reader feedback, and the many ham radio conventions that he attends with his staff. Rich, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? Well, I got interested in radio through Boy Scouts and CB. My scoutmaster was uh, very much into CB and got my dad involved in it because we would use CB rigs to communicate among different cars when we were on our way to camping trips. And uh, that got me interested in it as well. I enjoyed it, but found limitations in terms of how many different people you could talk to and how far you could talk. And one of my friends in high school introduced me to ham radio. He said, uh, you know, with a, he had just gotten his novice license and was telling me about the contacts he was making and invited me to a meeting of a newly formed ham radio club in my high school. And I distinctly remember the first meeting that I went to. One of the other kids had brought in a shortwave receiver. The club didn't have a station at the time. And we were up in a second floor classroom and he threw a piece of wire out the window and turned it on. And the first station we tuned in was Radio Tirana in Albania. This was 1969-70. And and Albania at the time was like North Korea today, very insular, cut off from the rest of the world in terms of communication. And here I was standing in a classroom listening to a radio station from Albania and and hearing their perspective on world events. It just fascinated me. And I was completely hooked (laughs) and have been ever since. I was sad to see just now that Radio Tirana is uh, going off the air. So it kind of ends my first chapter in uh, radio DXing. But beyond that, I got interested in ham radio through the club there. Was still active in Boy Scouts at the time. Wanted to get my radio merit badge. One of the requirements for the merit badge was to copy five word a minute Morse code for a minute. But you were exempt from that requirement if you held a ham license of any type. Of course, the five word a minute code requirement was what was required for the novice license at the time. So my thought, hating tests, was that if I'm going to take this test, I may as well make it count. So I took the code test for the ham license and got my novice license and, as a result, was exempted from having to take the code test again for the merit badge. Fascinating story that I learned about years and years later. My merit badge counselor at the time was a gentleman named Arnie Trossman, W2DTJ who I had no idea had recently moved to a different job from being editor of CQ magazine. And it was only years and years later that we discovered that crossover so very early in my ham career, at the very beginning, in fact. So you were destined to the the role that we're going to talk about a little bit later. What year did you get your novice? Uh, 1970. And how old were you? 15. I can relate. (laughs) But did you have any other Elmers or mentors that helped you along in those days? At that time, it was mostly the other young people in my high school radio club. In fact, we had a difficult time getting involved with other clubs, the regular radio clubs in our community. They wanted nothing to do with kids, which is something that fortunately has changed dramatically today and that that I have, have pushed for for a long time. But at 
that time, all but one club wanted nothing to do with kids as hams. We had to do a lot on our own and finally got hooked up with this one club that was welcoming to us, which was very helpful. But fortunately, that's changed. So you grew up in Tuland. Growing up in the, the northern suburbs of New York City, in the suburbs up uh, to the north of New York City, a uh, town called Spring Valley at the western side of the Tappan Zee Bridge, if anyone's familiar with uh, the geography of the Hudson Valley. You know, there's this picture from The New Yorker that shows Manhattan, New York, and then there's the Hudson River and then the California coast, and there's like nothing in the middle. So right. I'm from California, and so when I think of New York, I think of California, nothing in the middle, the Hudson River, and Manhattan. So I, I didn't know that there's actually northern suburbs of New York City. Thinking of that map, we would be in the eastern side of California. <laughs> <laughs> What was your first call sign? My first call sign was WN2QQN, a horrendous CW call. When did you upgrade? I upgraded about a year later. Interestingly, the, the structure of the license system at the time was such that when I got my novice license, it was a two-year non-renewable license. And about a year later, I went to the FCC in New York City to take my general test. Failed the code test by two characters. You had to copy 65 consecutive characters, and I had 63. And the examiner at the time said, well, why don't you take the written exam? You'll get your technician license if you pass that, and at least you'll have a permanent license, and you won't have to worry about the non-renewable novice. So I did that, and I passed, and I got a technician, which immediately took me off of virtually all CW, because at the time, technicians had no HF privileges at all, only VHF. And I found myself on 2-meter AM, and there was no opportunity to improve my CW speed so that I could easily get back and pass the general exam. And in fact, it took several years before I did that, basically until the FCC changed the rules a little bit and let technicians onto the HF novice bands, and I was able to get back on and, and get some practice and get my speed back up to where I could pass the uh, general code test. Do you remember your first rig? My first rig was borrowed. I had several first rigs. I'm trying to remember which came first. I had an ICO 720, which I think was the first first one. My receiver was a Halicrafters SX99, which I had borrowed from one of my uncles, who had previously been a novice but didn't upgrade in time and couldn't renew his license. I had that. I had borrowed for a while a homebrew rig. The first transmitter that I owned was a Halicrafters HT40, which was an AM and CW rig, crystal controlled. I don't know. I may still have that somewhere. Hidden in the attic somewhere, perhaps. Perhaps. You're listening to a 2017 interview with Rich Moseson, W2VU editor and publisher of CQ Magazine, one of the oldest ham radio publications still in circulation. We'll continue Eric Guth, 4Z1UG's QSO Today conversation with Rich after station ID. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. We'll be right back. You're tuned to the Rain Hamcast from Chicago, available both on therainreport.com and the Rain Report page on YouTube. What's your current rig? Current rig is uh, for HF and ICOM IC746. Mobile FM rig is a uh, Yaesu FT7800, and I have a Kenwood handheld. So I'm, I'm well covered on the major manufacturers. And I, so it's forcing me to get back into CW some more and to improve my code skills. So I'm really enjoying the kit building and general building. I've built a couple of amplifiers and filters out of plans rather than a kit, which is a whole different dimension of building because uh, you got to lay the things out yourself and figure out what works best where and how to structure your board. Do you have a construction method you like? Put the pieces in and solder them. <laughs> <laughs> Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Considering my career at the moment, absolutely. Um, my primary interest career-wise was journalism, specifically broadcast journalism when I was going to school. But ham radio helped with that, too, because we uh, – <laughs> this is a fun, funny story, or at least I hope it is. Back when I was in high school, one of the high schools in the, the next district over started up a 10-watt educational FM station. And our principal was very competitive, and he called the ham radio club people into his office one day, because we were the only ones who knew anything about radio. And he said, this other high school has started an FM radio station. I want you to find out what would be involved in doing it ourselves. 
So and we said, well, what kind of budget do we have? He said, what's in your treasury? <laughs> So, <laughs> which I think was about $25 at the time. At the time, I was club secretary, so I was the one who wrote to the FCC for information on getting an educational FM license. I got as far as the $300 filing fee and said, OK, we're not doing it this way. Went to the principal and showed him that. And he said, well, isn't there anything you can do, which we took as a complete license to do anything that didn't violate federal law? We essentially put together a fake radio station. We had got together and somebody had given us these two old airport transmitters that didn't work. We hollowed them out, wired up the lights and meters, put an audio amplifier in the back of it, liberated a turntable from someplace and created this fake radio station that broadcast to two speakers in the ceiling, one in our radio room and one in the hall next to our radio room. We told people it was at 108.1 on the FM dial, which of course is outside the FM band. We said that was the experimental portion of the FM band where the FCC has you operate while they decide whether to give you a permanent license. That's why you can't hear us in your car radio because the first thing that the manufacturers cut out for economy is those frequencies above the, the top of the band. You might be able to hear us at home, but we're only on during the school day. And if you know, you can try it when you're home, but it was great for getting out of class. My school started up a community internship program in my junior year. And one of the internships was with one of our local AM broadcast stations. And I was one of about 25 or 30 people who applied for that. And I was the one who got it. And the teacher who was organizing the program later said to me, you know, that there was a lot of competition for it, but I gave it to you because of your involvement in the school radio station. I never, ever had the heart to tell her. So my entire career is built on a hoax, which is logical. Well, we won't tell anybody, Rich. <laughs> yeah, keep it a secret. Did you get a, a broadcast journalism degree from one of the local uh, universities? I did get a broadcast journalism and political science degree from American University in Washington, D.C. Went to work in broadcast field for quite a while, radio and uh, wire service, writing for the Associated Press National Broadcast Wire, then spent over a decade at CBS News doing a variety of public affairs type programs. You're the editor of CQ Magazine. Can you give a brief history of CQ Magazine and how you came to be its editor? Well, CQ goes back to 1945. As the original publisher told the story, I talked to him for our 50th anniversary edition, which shows about how long I've been there. During World War II, QST was still publishing, I believe, and it was the only ham radio magazine out there. And the FCC chairman at the time didn't feel that it should be the only voice for amateur radio because he was anticipating hams coming back on the air when the war ended. And the gentleman who was became CQ's first publisher was publishing other magazines, had purchased a magazine from the West Coast called Radio, which morphed into audio magazine and then into CQ. And the way he tells it, he was approached by the FCC chairman who asked him, since this magazine had covered ham radio in the past, but had shifted over to more of an audio focus, if he would consider publishing a ham radio magazine since he didn't feel that QST should be the only voice for ham radio in the magazine world. And at the time, there was paper rationing because of the war. He told the FCC chairman, well, if you can get me the paper for it, I'll publish the magazine. And the FCC chairman said, consider it done. So he somehow got him the paper. We started publishing CQ in January 1945. Kept going every month ever since and plan to continue doing that for as long as we possibly can. Has the magazine changed or morphed over time or does it still pursue the same area? areas of interest that it had from the very beginning? Yes and no. The original goal of the magazine, its original purpose, was to have an ongoing conversation in print with its readers and to focus on practical, useful projects and articles and to share the fun and excitement of ham radio. That has not changed. We have stayed true to that goal over the past 73 years. What has changed, of course, is the content because we change with the hobby. Back in the 40s and 50s, the topics were CW and AM and a lot of military surplus stuff and how to convert surplus radios onto the ham bands. There was no digital at the time. Uh, we, we helped promote Radio Teletype or RIDI back in the 60s when it came on the scene. We've basically been in the forefront of a lot of new technology over the decades. 
the amateur satellite program got its start from an offhand comment in a column in CQ. We've early promoters of packet radio, various digital modes, a medium frequency and low frequency column to be able to help people get onto these new bands. So we've always tried to stay in, in the forefront of technology and to help people practically get using them and get the most out of them. In fact, my association with began with Packet Radio. I felt the magazine wasn't doing its job. I had worked with CQ publisher Dick Ross, K2MGA, back when I was still at CBS, putting together the Archie Ham Radio comic book that some people may remember. I was getting into Packet at the time. This was the early to mid-80s, I guess. I had gotten my TNC and got it hooked up and could not make any contact. was just pulling my hair out. All the magazine articles were on the technical side of things and how it worked. CQ had its annual Ritty special at the time and a big splash on the cover, including Packet Radio. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to figure out how to work this thing finally. And found the Packet article in there, and it was more about how it works, not how to work it. So I called up Dick Ross and said I was very disappointed in this issue. He said, why? He said, well, you know, I'm having a problem with, with Packet, and I know how it works. Everybody's told me how it works. Why haven't you told us how to work it? He said, because you haven't written it yet. I said, but I don't know. I need the help. He said, you find out and tell the rest of us. I did. <laughs> that was my first article in CQ it was a two part piece on how to operate packet and make successful contacts with it. It was the first article in any major ham magazine on how to actually use this mode. So that focus on practicality has been one of my focal points as long as I've been associated with the magazine. But it's been part of the magazine's focus since its beginning. Were you involved in Tapper? I was a member of it. I was not involved in its leadership or, or anything at that point, but I was definitely a member, and I have a somewhere on an old monitor here a Tapper sticker that says poop with a slash through it that stood for poor operating on packet. No poor operating on packet. This concludes our first of two excerpts from a QSO Today podcast featuring CQ Magazine longtime editor Rich Moseson. W2VU. Podcaster Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, spoke with Rich for an hour during his QSO Today podcast in 2017. We'll bring you our second excerpt from that conversation in Rain Hamcast number 88, scheduled to post May 6, 2023. Copyright 1985 2023. Rain. The Radio Amateur Information Network. All rights reserved. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Keep on hamming.